I want to talk about benzo hate mail. I've been getting some of this benzo hate mail. Uh, not a ton of it, but enough. You know, I see people in the comment sections of my videos. I'm sure you've seen them. But I get now I'm getting emails. And uh, some of them, let me, well, let me read you a passage. One said, Dave, you're on the wrong side of morality. You're misrepresenting and you're harming people that are much more debilitated by benzos. So the idea here is that uh, me promoting, you know, the, the, the importance of exercise and exposure therapy, for example, that I'm sort of somehow harming or overlooking people that are going through more serious benzo withdrawal. Now, I think this is a mischaracterization of myself, a uh, misrepresentation misrepres of what I've been teaching and what I've been and, and, you know, hammering this whole time. I've never told anyone, um, if you're really bad, you need to go join a gym and start exposing. What I have said is laying in bed for days at a time, months at a time, is going to manifest worse symptoms. And I've been completely you know, sympathetic, not even sympathetic, empathetic, because I've been there, of how hard it is and how painful and how much it hurts and how impossible it feels. But look, no matter how bad we are in this benzoyl journey, if the house was on fire, we could run out. You know, I'd say for 99.9% .9 of us, we are not debilitated to the point of not being able to move. We could run out of that house if we needed to. The problem is we just don't, we don't see the point. We, we, we don't have the energy. It hurts too much. And, and really, the, the bigger problem is the thing we need to do is, is the thing that hurts us the most. We need to exercise. We need to move. We need to expose. But what I tell people is start small. Start small. Walk to the mailbox and back. Can you, uh, can you honestly tell me if you're ruminating and, and isolating in your home and you have agoraphobia, you can't walk down the driveway to the mailbox and back? I think that'd be a cop-out for a lot of us. I think, I think most of us can do that. Oh, what's the point of that, Dave? I walk out there, go to the mailbox, and, and I come back, and I got a more, of a, more of a headache than I had before, and now I'm panicking. I'm anxiety. I'm, I'm ridden by, riddled by anxiety. What was the point of that? The point is two things. First off, it gets you moving, and that's super important. I mean, chemically speaking, and for your mental health, I mean, I could, I could post a bunch of peer-reviewed journals up here and, and make this a whole thing so you guys can get behind it and see, oh yeah, exercise is, <clears throat> exercise is pretty profound for mental health. Or you can Google search, go to Google Scholar, you can do your own research. Simply, it is super profound for mental health. Depression, uh, particularly depression and anxiety, reduces cortisol, helps with serotonin. I mean, exercise is an amazing thing. Start small. So getting you out of your house, walking to the mailbox, you're getting a little bit of exercise. It might be more exercise than you've gotten in weeks if you've been isolating enough. But it also does another thing. It gets you engaged with the, uh, a stimulus, the stimulus of the outside. It gets you away from your, your comfort zone and of sitting in your home. And what happens is you're able to go out to the mailbox. You're able to get the mail or reach the, this goal. The mailbox in this case is the goal. And you're able to achieve that and then come back to the house. And you show your brain, and you show your nervous system at that point, look, this didn't harm me, didn't kill me, didn't harm me. There was no threats out there, no monsters, no grizzly bears, no attacks. And, so, and if you keep doing this slowly but surely, what happens is your nervous system is rather lazy. It, it wants the path of least uh, resistance. So not, uh, after, you know, several encounters of this, it goes, okay, the mailbox is not a threat. I'll stop throwing up that. I, I'm going to stop throwing up such a heightened state of fight or flight. I'm going to stop releasing so much cortisol and adrenaline because it's a waste. I do that. The organism gets, you know, organism being us, gets beat, beaten down and it's less likely to facilitate their survival. And that's the ironic thing about uh, panic attacks and, and all this anxiety stuff is a lot of it's just faulty signals in our brain that's actually trying to help us survive. It's shooting us with adrenaline. It's getting us ready to evade danger. So it doesn't want us, it doesn't want to waste that. It, our ev evolution and our bodies are so brilliant that it does, it realizes that if it just kept doing that, the organism would become too weak to get food and fend for itself and it would die. And then it wouldn't be able to facilitate its, its species, its lineage. So it does the other thing. It actually reduces. It says, okay, this is no longer a real stimulus. It's, it's not bringing any kind of good. But here's where things go wrong. If you go out to the mailbox 
and you're scared and you're trembling and oh my God, you get out to the mailbox and you, you just get there and you turn around and you run back to the house. What you've actually just done is tell your nervous system that, oh, thank you, you've saved me. Because I went out there, I engaged the stimulus and thank God I was able to retreat from that stimulus quickly before any danger. So your, your brain does, doesn't know the difference, can't really discern in a way that we intellectualize these, these things. It just says, trigger, retreat, I save the organism. Good job. So guess what? Next time you go out there, you're more likely to have even a higher sa- uh, sense of, of panic and anxiety that will, again, make you run back into the house. So the whole goal of exposure therapy is to go into any stimulus, whether it's the mailbox or like I often talk about with, with my clients when they're ready to go to uh, garden sections of like Lowe's or Home Depot or something. It's, it's relatively less people there. It's quiet. It's not so much lighting. There's, you're surrounded by beauty. I say you go into these places with the intention of evoking a stimulus, evoking some anxiety. That's the goal, guys. It's not just to go there and be peaceful and walk around. You're looking for trouble. You walk into this place. Maybe you can only walk 15 feet into the, to the garden section before your panic is just almost through the roof. And then the goal is to stay with it, to sit with it and say, okay, uh, this is not harming me. These are just flowers. These are just regular people. I have no, there's nothing in here that's going to harm me. And I am not retreating. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to look at these flowers or whatever I'm doing. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk myself down from the ledge. I'm going to tell myself that this is okay. There's no harm here. There's no need to freak out. And I'm just going to, I'm going to walk myself through this thing. And then slowly but surely what happens is you walk in, you, your panic goes up to 8, 9, or 10. And after about 15, 20, 30 minutes, it starts to creep back down. And once it comes back down to about an 8, or 7, or 6, or a 5, job done. Job well done. You've shown your brain there is no need to go full throttle with this panic attack and this stimulus because it's not dangerous. So you leave. Next day, you come back, you do it again. Next day, you come back, you do it again. You keep beating it, and eventually your nervous system says, well, what's the hell, what's the point? Stop. This, this area is safe. Just like your home is safe. Your house has become the only thing that's safe. Everything around you, it's almost like uh, the world shrinks when you have agoraphobia and, and, and you're going through this, and your house becomes this little ledge, this little last remnant of safety in the planet. It's the only place that you can go. I mean, you open the door, you walk out overwhelming immediately. We have to spread that. We have to teach our brains that there's more, t- there's more to it that's safe than what it's now been faulty conditioned to believe. So again, we go through it. We go to the mailbox multiple times. Before you know it, the mailbox stops throwing up these panic uh, attack signals. And here's the amazing thing about this. These are small victories that lead to much bigger uh, victories, right? So you beat the mailbox. Now you went from, and this is science, guys. I mean, this is, this is overwhelmingly works for uh, pretty much everybody. You know, I don't care how bad you are. You, you walk to that mailbox and you do it the way I'm telling you just right. You will see a lessening of the symptoms. You will see your brain stop throwing out panic attack signals, responses to the mailbox, let's say. Now, if you do this once a month, don't expect much. Because you've, you've, told, you've shown your brain 29 other days of the, of the month that hiding in the house was actually saving you. So it's, con- it's counterintuitive. You've got to do this every day. But s- slowly but surely, your brain stops throwing up the signals that the, that the mailbox is a danger zone. There's no dinosaurs. There's no monsters out there going to get us. So what do you do? You walk down a couple of houses. You do that for a couple of weeks, a couple of months. And initially, your anxiety goes higher. You do the same process you walk with it, you go a little further, you evoke the anxiety, you convince yourself it's okay, you, and then you come back home, and you come back to the house. And, and the important difference is, guys, whether you're driving, whether you're walking down the street and doing this ex- experiment or this uh, exposure, is not to run away. So if you're driving and you're getting this panic feeling, oh, I got I to turn around, I got to freak out, I got to pull over, the important thing, again, is to calm yourself, say, you know what? Um, I'm having some symptoms. I'm feeling a little dizzy. It's okay. I'm going to pull over for a minute. I'm going to catch my breath. And so you pull over. But whatever you do, you choose to do it. You're doing it in control. Okay? And it might seem like a minor thing. Oh, what's the difference, Dave? 
If I whip the wheel over and I pull over in a panic on the side of the road quickly, what's the difference between that versus me just telling myself, it's okay, pull over? Well, the, the difference is small, seemingly, but massive. The difference is you're choosing to pull over. It's a choice you're making. Now, when you stand in uh, the garden section and you're feeling anxious and you want to run back to the car because screw this, you're making a choice. I'm not evading danger because there is no danger. I'm going to sit here until my brain gets behind it. And so the, ma- the amazing thing that happens is, going back to my point 10 minutes ago, <laughs> that all your symptoms start to reduce. It's not just that we're going out through the world. Okay, now I'm not afraid of the mailbox. Okay, now I'm not afraid of two houses down. Now I can walk to the stop sign. Now I can walk to the corner store. Now I can drive around the block. Now I can walk around Lowe's garden section. Great. How's that going to benefit my life? Well, the thing is, you're, you're beating down, in general, this fight-or-flight response system in your brain. These are just techniques. You know, just as sure as sitting down, staring at a flame, meditating, uh, brings profound peace in all situations, not just when you're sitting there looking at the flame. It's, it's a reconditioning of your whole uh, nervous system. So, there's some, uh, hopefully there's some information on how to do exposure therapy correctly, And, uh, yeah, we'll talk more. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching and listening. Please click the like and subscribe button if you enjoyed the content. And be sure to check out my book on Amazon, The Powers Manual, Benzel Guide to Recovery.